Craig B and I are going to be talking today about arts, medicine, and theology. Now, on your tables, um, because sometimes um, the two of us get boring, we put some paper and some crayons so that you can doodle and don't get bored. <laughs> Actually, we put this on the table because we want you to do something if you're willing to, which is to draw an image that comes to your mind of pain. P-A-I-N, pain. You can interpret the word pain however you want to. You can draw any kind of image that you want. If you have something that involves words instead, that's perfectly fine. And in a few minutes, we'll pick those up and we're gonna take a, a few of them um, and throw them up here on the screens during the question and answer session uh, and see where the pictures take us. Or at the very least, just see what kind of images come out of the group. Now, one of the questions that I have arises from my experience, not only as a physician, a physician who's been practicing for around 20 years, but as someone who pays close attention to my colleagues and someone who spends a lot of effort with residents and fellows and medical students forming new physicians. And I pay attention to the way that we get sick in the United States. Now, there are going to be some generalizations, and so I certainly don't think that this applies to everyone. But very often in contemporary healthcare, this is the sort of trajectory that we see of our illness, especially as we move towards the end of life and have severe illness or chronic illness that's getting worse. And we'll start out at one area, we'll have a crisis and get sick. We'll be treated almost always in the hospital since that's where medical care is focused. And then we recover, but maybe not to quite the level that we were at. Go along for a while, have another crisis. We get tended, mended, and we get better. But again, maybe not quite to the level that we were at. And there's this series of crisis, recovery, crisis, recovery, until finally, we have a crisis, and no matter what we do, we can't recover. And along the way, we very often see patients having increased symptom burdens, as well as losses that are significant, whether it's a loss of function, a loss of opportunity, or a loss of place, for example, being home, when you're in the hospital for long periods of time. Now, Anyone who's spent time in a medical intensive care unit or talked to a medical care intensivist knows that both families and staff grieve the fact that some of the folks are in there and they probably never needed to be there, wanted to be there, it doesn't fit the rest of their life. And yet somehow the juggernaut of medicine just didn't seem to stop. The physicians are unhappy, the nurses will be unhappy with it, the family's unhappy with the situation, and the patient is tangled up in a ventilator on dialysis with cardiac medicines, sedated, basically unable to experience the last part of their life. If no one's happy with this in some cases, where there doesn't seem to be any endpoint other than dying on a ventilator, why does it happen? Why is it that we get so tangled? at the end of our lives in intensive care units? This is a question that a lot of people are asking. And now I'm very happy to see the conversation becoming more public. Basically, everything is this guy's fault. <laughs> this is Francis Bacon. And he's actually a wonderful thinker, a wonderful philosopher, and he is one of the pioneers of the scientific method. He's a guy who said, in response to illness, not that we should just find ways to endure, but as he watched the development of the scientific method, he said, why don't we apply this to illness? And instead of simply having our physicians tell us when we're overcome with our illness and that it's time to get our lives together, why don't we instead use the scientific method and try to figure out ways to solve medical problems and to heal people? And so this happened. And along the way, especially as we moved into the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, medicine began to take more and more the appearance, at least, of science. 
One transitional figure, one of my heroes named William Osler, was instrumental in transforming medicine and moving it towards an evidence-based sort of scientific approach. But he also felt that it was crucial at the turn of the century for a physician to see the home where a person lives, to see the community, the environment, the resources, to understand where the person's coming from. This pioneer of the scientific method in medicine also said it's more important to know the person who has the disease than to know which disease the person has. But along the way, as we got better and better at scientific method, our physical exam changed and our instruments became better. We had something as a mediator between our hands and the patient, but it improved what we could see and what we could hear. In the late 1800s, we began developing these graphic instruments so that we could turn things like the pulse into a number and into a waveform. In 1897, x-rays were invented. Now we're able to take a picture of the inside of a person, put it up in front of a light without ever touching the person, and see what's on the inside. In 1912, electrocardiograms began to develop. We were able to trace the electrical activity of the heart on a piece of paper without necessarily seeing the patient. In the early 1900s, we saw clinical laboratories become more and more sophisticated. Now we don't even have to have the whole patient, just a piece. And we can take a piece of the patient into the laboratory and diagnose what the disease is. And we understand now what's wrong with the patient. And since the 1950s, the gold standard in medicine has been very large, randomized studies in an attempt to drive medicine more and more towards an evidence-based approach to taking care of people who are ill. But the aim of these large studies is to eliminate all of the variability among patients so that we can make generalized statements that are applicable to anyone who happens to show up with a body. This has led to a lot of wonderful innovations. For those who can't see, it says he's cured. <laughs> the point of this slide is that any of us who've practiced medicine long enough have seen the ways in which otherwise wonderful technologies that just clip along because it's the next thing to do can end up putting people into a place where the cure is worse than the disease. And there's not a single bit of maliciousness or malevolence or ill will in the process of someone moving towards this kind of state. So the question becomes, why does it happen? Again, that's the question that we want to approach. I think there are at least two reasons. One of the reasons is because of the way that we form physicians, and one of the reasons is because of the way that we form patients. So there's a sense in which the answer to this is to have better formed doctors, but also to have better formed patients. Now, I'm going to give you 60 seconds on how doctors are formed in the United States. Again, this is a bit of a caricature. But what happens is an otherwise relatively normal person goes to medical school. <laughs> and they take their first course and get their first patient who is dead. And with their cadaver, they begin to study anatomy. And they learn where all the pieces are. They learn where all the molecules are sitting when they're still. Then they move on to their next course, which is called physiology. And in physiology, they begin to study what it looks like for these molecules to move in the right direction. Their next course is pathology. And in pathology, they learn what rogue molecules look like that are moving in the wrong direction or threatening to slow down and stop moving <coughs> at all. Then they go to the wards and they begin to learn surgical and medical techniques to make the rogue molecules go back in the right direction. Or if they're slowing down, make them speed back up. And then they graduate from medical school and they're a doctor. And they've achieved two things. Number one, they've acquired a definition of life. Definition of life is molecules moving in the right direction. And the second thing they've acquired is a vocation. Their vocation is when molecules are moving in the wrong direction or threatening to slow down, figure out a way to make them move in the right direction. That's their definition of life, 
and that's their vocation. That was mine. The problem that comes up is that there's an enormous amount lost when we think that this approach to illness, to suffering, to dying, to a human experience that everyone in this room at some point is going to have, there's an enormous amount lost when we try to reduce it to the language of molecules moving in the right direction, the language of biology. What happened to the rest of the story? So our contention is that theology and the arts has a lot to say to bring the rest of the story back into the picture and to radically rethink the way that we approach the human experience of illness, suffering, and dying for the sake of the people who are having the experience and for the sake of the people who care for them. The reason I mention the people who care for them is that in the past several years, there have been a number of, number of articles coming out about physician burnout. One article was in the New England Journal of Medicine, another article was in JAMA. And these two articles showed a striking reality, which is that depression among physicians is approaching 50%. That suicidal ideation is rising. The number of physicians who would tell their children to avoid becoming physicians is rising. The number of physicians who wish that they could escape medicine, but they don't see a way out, is rising. And that's a problem, because medicine is an astonishing privilege to show up in another person's life at a point where they're experiencing one of the deepest crises that they may face, and then to help them. How could that not be great? What's wrong? What are we missing in the way that we form physicians? The conflict that many physicians come up against is that we're trained to trust objective data like laboratory results and numbers. But anyone who gets sick, including doctors when they get sick, anyone who gets sick is going to experience their illness not in terms of numbers or biology, but in terms of the things in their life that actually matter, that are being threatened by the potential for loss or by their hopes by the questions that they may have never asked before about their worldview as they feel their body become frail. These are the kinds of things that frame our actual experience, even though the language of medicine is largely the language of biology. This says, you must clearly explain your problem. Um, I've felt like this more than once. Fortunately, I've made it 10 minutes into the talk without looking like this, I hope. <laughs> but it's very difficult for patients and families often to communicate to the medical caregivers what it is that's wrong or what it is they need or what it is they care about or what makes a difference in their decisions. And the two biggest issues that I see this becoming true for are first of all, death. We find it incredibly hard to talk about death. This says, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. I can't tell you how many times I've at least felt that until some of my patients taught me how to talk about it. And I certainly see many of my colleagues and my students who feel this when it comes time to have these sorts of difficult conversations. This is a quote by Woody Allen that I love because it captures a great deal of how people in America view death. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. And I get that. When I think about myself, I strike myself as somebody who's much better off alive than dead. <laughs> and yet the fear of death and the unreflective approach to this fear is one of the things that drives many of our problems when we address the experience of illness, suffering, and dying in America. Pain is the second thing, and I'm using this as a placeholder for suffering, for loss in general. I had a patient recently, I, have, I do many pain consults, I had one recently a 15-year-old girl who had chronic pain, and often people with chronic pain are not believed entirely. They've learned techniques for managing their pain, techniques like using video games, staying very still in bed. But the resident will walk in and say, what's your pain? And they'll say, it's horrid. And then come and talk with me and say, I think she's faking. She was just laying quietly in bed playing video games. There's no way she's got horrible pain. 
And so I went to the girl and I said, okay, I need a different way for you to tell me what your pain is. That's the picture she drew. That's what pain looked like to her. She was an artist and she was able to use her art to help me understand the inside of her pain in a way that I simply um, would not have been able to understand it by listening to reports from the rest of the medical team. And we were able to do all sorts of things to help her with her pain after we finally understood it. We can't understand the meaning of these deep decisions that we make around our bodies, around these mysterious experiences when we're on the threshold of dying, unless we think about the whole story. So we've got to ask the question, and this is not a question that's very often asked in medical school, but it's asked in the divinity school regularly. What is a story? I've learned as a physician who has the privilege of teaching in the divinity school that stories are a central part of how the divinity school approaches human experience, and they're very powerful. So I'm going to give you an example of a story, and I'm going to do it using the <coughs> different parts um, of a story that form essentially the core of any great novel, any great story, um, no matter how it's uh, on the surface structured. So if any of you want to write stories, or if you want to write a novel, I'm about to tell you how to do it. Every great story that's ever been told has these parts. Number one, once upon a time. Once upon a time introduces us to the person and to the situation. Once upon a time, there was a composer in Vienna named Salieri. Has anyone here seen or heard of Amadeus? All right, that's the story I'm telling you. Once upon a time, there was a composer named Salieri who had traded his entire life in service to God in exchange for the privilege of exploring music in Vienna. Second part of a story. And every day, Salieri composed beautiful music for the king, and he was honored in the court, and he enjoyed being honored in the court. Until one day, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart showed up in Vienna. And this little man suddenly caught the attention of everyone in the city, including the king. They loved his music, but when Salieri heard his music, he knew that God was speaking through this irritating, foul little man. <laughs> and because of this, he began to become jealous and to question why God had given such a talent to such a awful little human being. And because of this, he began to plot ways to block Mozart's music and eventually plotted a way to have him die until finally he ended up at the bedside of the dying little musician as he was composing a requiem. And Mozart died a pauper's death and was buried in a pauper's grave. And ever since that day, Salieri was confined in a sanitarium, listening to the laughter of God, bitter and resentful. What's the story? Once upon a time, there was a little girl, 15 years old. Every day, she enjoyed playing her piano, going to school, playing with her friends, playing with her animals, being with her parents, until one day, the doctor walked in because of some funny cells and said, sweetie, I'm sorry, I have some hard news. Those funny cells are leukemia. And because of this, she began chemotherapy, which required that she be in the hospital and that she be away from all the activities and friends that she loved. And because of this, her hair began to fall out. She began to become thin because of poor nutrition. She became lonely, she became sad, until finally, and here we've got two possible paths, right? Maybe medicine cured her. The other path, maybe medicine can't cure her. And we have to walk in and say, I'm sorry, but it's back despite our best medicine. This part, and ever since that day, in the first scenario, I'll have one appearance, and the second, if there is no cure, 
and her days are short, it's going to have a different appearance. And this is certainly, we should, be, we should be asking about the story throughout the entire illness, but in that space of ever since that day, we will have no idea how to help her make decisions and live her life to the fullest in the final part of her life if we understand nothing but the biology of her cancer because biology will never tell us what matters to her. The only way we can know what matters to her and actually help her with the decisions is if we know the whole story, which means we have to stop and listen and use skills that are much more like listening to stories than like what I learned in medical school. So if you ever want to help me at the end of my life, there's a few things you need to know about me. But since I'm hopefully not immediately at the end of my life, I'm not going to tell you what those are. <laughs> the point I want to leave you with is that just because we think we see something doesn't mean it's there. Try counting the black dots. The point of this slide is that when we walk into a room with our own agenda, assuming that we know what we see, we're in no position to allow ourselves to be changed by the reality of who's actually there. Jeremy and I are making the argument that at least one important part of changing medicine and changing some of the hardest things about the experience of illness, suffering, and dying, and the experience of being with people who are ill can come through theology and the arts because they help us to see, to hear, to express, and to understand experience like nothing else. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy. One of the great pleasures of working at Duke is the honor and delight of working with people like Ray Barfield, who incidentally is also a poet and a novelist and a guitarist and a few other things as well that he does at five in the morning every day before he goes to work. Hearing him speak has reminded me again of all the unexpected intersections that you find between disciplines and different perspectives on the human person, on the human life. I'm Jeremy Begbie. I teach at the Divinity School. My original professional training was in music, and I'm interested in the intersections between music and faith and music and theology. Not so long ago, I was asked to play some piano music before a wedding service at a church near Duke. The idea was to create an atmosphere of quiet expectation as the congregation gathered. But as the congregation grew, so did the noise level exponentially. This lot just wouldn't stop talking. The louder I played, the louder they got. I tried everything from Bach to bebop, but nothing would get this crowd of hyper-talkative American Presbyterians to shut up. <laughs> Until I thought, Hmm, well, shall I risk it? <laughs> Total silence. <laughs> I could only assume that I was tapping into something deep in their psyche, some primal memory of a home that they'd long forgotten, half-remembered British accents, green summers, country gardens, going downstairs to tell the servants off, going upstairs to take your hat off, and the music was putting them in touch with their inner colonial, their inner Englishness. What a wonderful experience that was. Ray has been talking about stories. He's been saying if you want to tap deep into the patient, listen to the stories. Stories help us see, hear, express, and understand experience. I want to give you a kind of musical take on that, and argue that music helps us see, hear, express, and understand experience. If you want to get at what makes someone tick, if you want to find out what's going on, if you want to understand a congregation before a wedding, if you want to get in touch with the inner Englishness of an American, try playing music. Don't ask them about biology. Play some music. Music also works by telling stories, but not in words, rather in notes or tones, in pitch sounds that dance 
and jostle with each other in songs and symphonies. Ray's been saying that there's a kind of basic story behind all stories, or most stories. And the same goes for music, or at least the kind of music we know best. The type of music we know best, flower in the late, or actually early 17th century, and it's usually called tonal music, or Western tonal music, and it surrounds us today in shopping malls, in restaurants, in radios, uh, indeed, whether it's Beethoven, or bebop, or folk rock, R&B, hip-hop, or trip-hop, it's Western tonal music. And there's a kind of basic story underlining this kind of music. And surprise, surprise, it's shaped very like the one Ray's been telling. Let's try to hear it. How did you wake up this morning? Did you need an alarm to wake you up? How many people woke up with an alarm? Some people did, but not everyone. Okay, well, you can imagine yourself asleep, and suddenly, suddenly, very early in the morning, perhaps, it goes off. And you ram your hand down all over the bedside table to try to find the button sh shoving off whatever you read in, like, um, the collected works of Richard Broadhead or whatever you had on <laughs> the side. Of it. And eventually, your sleepy hand finds the right button. Tension, resolution. One of the most basic psychological patterns governing our lives. From traffic lights on red to traffic lights on green, from nerves before the dentist to relief when it's all over. From sounds like this to sounds like that. If you hear this in this culture, you expect, want, desire that. To a set of Mozart, if he heard this, even if he was asleep and two stories up, he'd wake up, run all the way downstairs just to play that because he couldn't bear that unresolved. And writing Western music is about handling the dynamic space between that, or sounds like it, and that. It all depends how you resolve your tensions. And as your therapist will tell you, there are many ways of resolving your tension. One of the most interesting is this device, and it's called an appoggiatura. That first little note is dissonant with the chord underneath, and it's quickly resolved. Here's another one. Barber. Do you recognize that? Barber adagio for strings. Here it comes. Yeah. That's an appoggiatura. John Sloboda of Keel University, a very distinguished music psychologist, done a lot of research on the appoggiatura because he's found that over and over again in music that people say moves them very deeply, you will find a preponderance of appoggiaturas. Take this one. Thank you. Boy, they take a bit of warming up, don't they? <laughs> There's an appoggiatura. And here's another. Now, I'm going to take out these appoggiatures. I'm going to fill it them out, all right? So we're just left with everything but appoggiatures. Would you buy it? <laughs> Would you know that in 40 years? I changed only two little notes. But that's only one kind of tension resolution. There are many others, and the cumulative effect of all these is to pull you forward. You want or desire the next sound, or any number of sounds, in the future. And what could be more appropriate than for this event? <laughs> we are thinking forward. It's a very American way of thinking. It's forward, the future. The future beckons. In Britain, we think, oh, it's a bit problematic. It didn't work in 1792. It's not going to work. I don't know. Don't know if it'll work. Yeah, it's probably going to rain. <laughs> So let's widen the view a bit further, because this is only part of the... Ray's been taking, talking about the whole story. Attention, of course, needs something before it in relation to which it is attention. You were asleep before the alarm went off. We'll call that equilibrium. So the full pattern is, in fact, equilibrium, tension, and resolution. Or to put it another way, home, away, and home again. That's home. We're still at home. 
But we've had enough being in home. We're going to go for a walk around the block. We're away. But we've had enough of going outside because it's raining and a bit wet like it is outside today in Dallas, so we're going home again. That's a quick peep out of the door, but we don't like it outside. It's home again. So, home, away, and home. Very simple. Or to put it in raised terms, once upon a time, equilibrium, until one day, the equilibrium is disturbed. And then, yes, a resolution of sorts. And I'm going to concentrate quite a bit on this third element. Notice, it is not a circular movement. The home, I put a capital H there. This is not circular time. That third part, when it comes back again, it's note for note repetition, but you don't hear it the same way because it's come at the end of a sonic journey. So you hear it as richer. Capital H, home. It's a thought, isn't it? Practically every song you've ever sung, every hymn, if you sing hymns, every symphony, has this story built into it, as do, of course, many of the world's religious faiths, the Jewish scriptures. We begin with Genesis, with the joyful equilibrium of the Garden of Eden. And we go on to hear of the tension created by Adam's fall and the hope of a restoration, a final day when God will put things to right. Christians believe that that resolution has reached a climax in the person of Jesus and will eventually be worked out in a final giant resolution. But that final destination is not a return to the beginning. It is to what the Bible calls a new creation, a kind of giant cosmic makeover, a new heavens and a new earth. And nested within this giant ETR are lots of little ETRs, like the one that Jesus told about a young man who insulted his father at home and went away to a far country, only to return to a welcome where home was even more important than before, a capital H home, the so-called parable of the prodigal son. Ray has said stories help us hear, express, and understand experience. This story, so basic to human faith, is inscribed into the DNA of most music in sound. Music helps us see, hear, express, and understand that story without any words. Unexpected intersections. But before I finish, I want to push all this one stage further. Because music, I think, not only helps us hear, express, and understand experience, it also reshapes it. Music forms us, shapes us, and sometimes, indeed often perhaps, for the better, in at least four ways. First, it reshapes you by combining dissonance with hope. This tension in the middle can be quite mild, but it can also be mild. It can also be fairly dissonant. Music takes you into some dark places. Ray reminds us that pain and death can be very hard to talk about. But music often speaks where words fail. Ray mentioned the film Amadeus, a movie which begins with the opening of Mozart's Requiem, written just before Mozart died. so much pathos being packed into 30 seconds. Virtually every chord, as it happens, is in the minor mode, which generally people will experience as more dissonant than, say, the major. In that introduction, there's only two major chords. All the rest are minor. But perhaps more important, it's laden, this music, with appoggiaturas. Did you hear them? Here's another one. Mm. 
and here's a very poignant one which you don't expect. You hear that? Which resolves onto another one. Just a bit of sunlight. And here's another one. This generates a barely contained sense of, it's very trite to say it, but emotional pain. I say barely contained, but it is contained, and that's the point. The constantly resolving tensions create a forward drive, and underneath we have the steady pulse of the bass line itself creating these waves. Of tension and resolution, yet another level in which that's happening. Music can scoop into the darker depths of life, so to speak, without losing its sense of direction and purpose. And that way it can help reshape your experience and disappointment and illness and loss. And that's why we play such music at funerals. And it's one of the reasons, of course, why as a theologian I'm especially interested in music because the Christian hope is founded not on some escapism, but on the conviction that God has entered the very worst that life can throw at us in order to promise a future worth living for. Second, music reshapes us by making us wait in the midst of delay. I could take this and resolve it straight away, or I could hold it back. Should we delay again? Yeah. Should we delay again? <laughs> yes, church organists get used to doing this when the pastor doesn't turn up in time. <laughs> and eventually he turns up and we can resolve. That's known as deferred or delayed gratification. And there's some lovely examples all over music like this. Do you recognize that? What's it called? Fiorellis. It's the piece you played just before you gave up the piano. Okay? <laughs> now, what does Beethoven do? He does this. Well, he could do this. If he was an ordinary composer. And I think we would need and symmetrical for 16, 32, 64. But he doesn't. Because he's Beethoven. He just puts in an extra bar there, and that's why you gave up the piano. <laughs> it's actually a hard piece. Deferred gratification. When the resolution is delayed or deferred. Great example in John Coltrane's Love Supreme that many of you will know. But you're made to wait about 20 minutes. Of course, if you listen to an opera of Wagner, you're made to wait about four and a half hours. Uh, but this is the point, that the waiting need not be empty or void. You are enriched in the waiting. Hope lives in the midst of delay. I'm not saying anything as crass as delay is always good for you. Many of you here will be coping with awful delay at the moment, waiting for tests, waiting for this, waiting for that. My own brother is a chronic schizophrenic. For 25 years I've been waiting for healing. Not yet. But don't we have to say that there is a kind of waiting in the midst of delay where we learn something new of incalculable value that can be learned in no other way? Music has a lot to teach us here because it makes us wait. And really good music really makes you wait. Again, as a theologian, I'm especially interested in that because the Christian faith is so full of learning how to be patient. Isn't it interesting the word patient? What do people do? What do patients do in hospital most of the time? They wait. What does a hospital chaplain do? Help people wait. It's a thought, isn't it? Third, music reshapes you by generating empathy. And I mean here the ability to discern and even share in and align yourself with the emotional state of another. A lot of very interesting research going on at the moment in this. Some of it by my friend and colleague uh, Ian Cross in Cambridge and this uh, fascinating researcher now living in Jerusalem. They did research on children, 8 to 11-year-olds, on how music could generate a sense of empathy. 
And the results were extraordinary. They found not only could children so we'll read the emotional states of others through sound very quickly, but that actually uh, increased skills in empathetic acknowledgement later in life as well. As a Duke student said to me last week, you can't demonize those you've just made music with. Isn't that interesting? And that's the conviction behind this orchestra, the East-West Divan Orchestra. Young musicians gathered from Arab and Jewish backgrounds together under the conductor Daniel Barenboim, radically opposed ethnic groups producing astonishing sounds. Barenboim's colleague, Edward Said, writes that here we learn that music can be, I quote, an expression not only of what life is, but an expression of what life could be or what it could become, unquote. Music is reshaping these young people. You can't demonize those you've just made music with. Fourth, and lastly, music reshapes us by re-timing us. In his great book, Musicophilia, the clinical neurologist writes for a patient called Clive Waring, who's a musician stricken with severe amnesia in 1985. From one minute to the next, Clive doesn't know who, where, or what he is. He's now in his 70s. Only two things keep him together. A deep love for his wife, and his ability to sing or play any piece of music put in front of him. Music, for him, is like a rope let down from heaven. Without performance, the thread is broken, and he's thrown back once again into the abyss. A piece of music, we could say, gives him something with temporal continuity, something that moves from a meaningful past to a hoped-for future. Why am I interested in these things as a theologian? because I believe faith is about re-timing us. It sets us in a story with a past we can celebrate and a future we can hope for. So theology, the arts, medicine, I hope you've enjoyed seeing these unexpected intersections. Thank you very much.